All right. Boa tarde. Boa tarde a todos. Afternoon. Just, waiting, just a few more minutes and then uh, I think we'll be starting. All right. I believe we are only missing the first speaker. Hmm. Yes. All right, I think we'll have to start, even though I think we're still missing one of the, of the speakers in the program. Uh, I believe we have to start and uh, we'll hope that uh, he'll join us uh, later on. So with that said, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this, uh, to another panel uh, uh, on this very, very interesting and fruitful conference, the, the seventh international conference on Eurasian politics and society. Uh, organized together by CESRAM International Autonoma University of Lisbon and uh, the Observar Research, Research Center. Uh, and we are very delighted to have this very specific uh, panel this afternoon on great power politics in search for new world order. We have uh, quite a roster of presentations, very interesting ones, and we are very much looking forward to hearing them all. Uh, 
just some ground rules that you are all probably well familiar with by now in this new modern kind of uh, conferences which have to occur remotely. Uh, each speaker will have uh, 15 minutes for their uh, own presentations. And uh, I would ask all of them to, to, to be mindful uh, of their time so that we have uh, enough time as well uh, for the Q&A afterwards and to uh, give our audience members uh, the privilege and the opportunity to, to pose some questions and maybe even uh, be helpful for your own research uh, agendas. In turn, I would only ask uh, our audience, which is growing by the numbers as I speak, and I can see from, uh, fr from the, the menu on our right, but I would only ask the audience to remain with their audio turned off so that they don't disturb the, the due course uh, of the session and that they allow the, 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 the speakers uh, to, to present their work uh, in peace and without uh, uh, interruptions. Uh, during the Q&A, uh, if you could, uh, I would ask the audience uh, if you could uh, write, uh, pose your questions in the chat uh, in, on your right. I will then try and uh, do my very best to collect the bulk of them or most of them and uh, turn them uh, to, to the speakers uh, themselves. And uh, with that said, I think we can uh, try to see if the very first, our very first speaker uh, is present, uh, Pogation Adrian, uh, but I don't believe uh, is in, a, he has access to session uh, yet. So I would probably uh, just uh, give the virtual floor uh, to the second speaker in line, uh, Andrew uh, Long from International Consultants and Investment Hong Kong with a presentation on how will the reintegration of China's Belt and Road Initiative fare uh, in defending a multipolar world order. Uh, Mr. Long, I turn well, the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, this is my first time uh, on this conference. Um, so, and my first time making my presentation on Zoom, but let's just try see whether it works. I'm trying to, okay, share it. Can you see it? Um, yeah, can you see the, the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, you can see the slides, right? Yes. Right? Okay, now I've got a lot of slides to go through. So, um, in fact, you can have uh, uh, access my website and there was, uh, I've downloaded there, but I've got to, um, uh, to go through it very, very quickly because it just focus on the leading uh, title. Um, now, um, we're talking about the whole world order. Um, in fact, the, the, um, the rise of the West uh, was characterized by the rise of uh, Portugal. Um, and uh, in this uh, kind of maritime uh, exploits uh, around the world um, with the, um, um, the discovery uh, of the new world, as it were. And in fact, um, I spent my boyhood in Macau and Macau was the, uh, the, uh, the uh, first port of call uh, of the Portuguese um, expansion to the east. Um, now, um, and, and then um, trace fast forward uh, we have the, 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 the um, uh, after Portugal, you have Spain, um, you have um, uh, France, uh, and then um, you have the Netherlands, and, and uh, you have the Netherlands, and then you have France, and then you have uh, Britain. But then, um, uh, and ending up with the, um, uh, the rise of the United States, um, uh, taking over from uh, British um, ruled world called Pax uh, Britannica. So we have, we have seen the rise of the Western powers, particularly the so-called maritime powers. Um, and then, of course, with American capitalism, um, it is, uh, we have seen a unipolar world uh, since the end of the Second World War, uh, because they, with the collapse of the former USSR, and when the world is turning flat with globalization, uh, America really reigned supreme. But um, in this kind of globalization, um, especially with the help uh, of by the United States of wooing China into the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Uh, and then a lot of the Asian countries who have been great beneficiaries. You can see that the gross national product um, 
of the, the, the Eastern uh, powers, um, Eastern countries, particularly uh, China, have risen dramatically during this period. Um, and then during this period as well, uh, China has become the center of the global and supply value chain. Everything, um, uh, most of the stuff you see in department stores around the world have now been made in China because the, uh, the United States felt it um, um, beneficial to outsource all these cheap products uh, or the production of these products, including polluting uh, industries uh, to China. And China had to accept it because uh, China want to um, have to, to find jobs for its millions of, of, of workers. Um, and then the, um, with this uh, kind of scenario, uh, China's growing um, uh, strong, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the economy growing um, uh, bigger and bigger. You can see on the top left-hand corner is predicted by the year um, uh, 2000, well, we're not too far from there. Uh, 2030, uh, China could become the, uh, the largest economy in the world. But in fact, uh, because of the pandemic, um, this could be delayed a little, but on the other hand, don't forget the pandemic is also affecting uh, the United States economy as well. So according to the latest um, in-house um, report by Goldman Sachs, um, and the uh, China is expected to overtake the United States economy in real terms by 2020, um, um, 2032. Um, and then the, the remarkable thing about this uh, scenario is that uh, China has become the largest trading partner for 124 countries compared with 56 for the United States. So China really sits at the, at the hub, as the central hub of the global and supply and value chain. Um, and then because of growth of China and all the Asian powers, we're, we're seeing um, the emergence of the Asian century. Uh, by the year 2050, it's predicted that the Asian economy uh, would um, exceed over half of the world economy. Various books have been written about the uh, rise of Asia, uh, as well as rise of the East, uh, including, uh, of course, uh, India. Um, and um, however, uh, this globalization has its drawbacks. And in fact, that the uh, Nobel Prize laureate, Joseph Stinglitz, um, uh, earlier on, have already highlighted um, that uh, some of the um, undesirable uh, effects of globalization as major multinationals uh, taking their money to developing countries and forcing um, um, maybe unequal trading terms uh, on their host countries. If the ho certain host country doesn't accept these terms, they go next door. So um, I think that um, the result has been environmental degradation and unfair practices uh, of um, maybe dumping the kind of uh, substandard um, medical products on developing uh, countries. Um, and then you, um, this globalization also um, have um, uh, seen a great, the emergence of great inequality. Six, 62 uh, of the 62 richest persons on earth the richest uh, 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 people on earth, you know, and, 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 and has more wealth uh, than the other half of the global um, population. Um, again, the rise of China has perceived to be uh, a kind of threat um, because uh, coming from a different uh, uh, background, civilization, political ideology is seen to be threatening a lot of the um, um, uh, values held dear in the West. So you can see on the economic front, uh, the trade practices, um, the military front, um, maybe even uh, the threat of imposing a moral doctrine in the South China Sea, um, and then others uh, like human rights and so on and so forth. So that's why the, the, uh, the, the United States across the board, across the, the political spectrum is seeing China as a major threat. Um, and then of course the, um, the United States is um, forming um, 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 military and intelligence alliance, like the Five Eye Alliance, uh, together with its uh, major allies, um, and in a 360 degrees pushback against China, together with this, um, the formation of the so-called uh, court, uh, the, um, with, with um, uh, Canada, Australia, um, and, and then India uh, and Japan, uh, forming a kind of alliance um, to push back against China. Now, this China scare uh, is, 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 is also um, 
has has fed into a, a, a great deal of China bashing. Um, and it's not only the trade war, it's technology and, and, and the latest TikTok affair um, on Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, um, you name it. Um, and even um, uh, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo uh, is uh, in his latest remarks is terming China as a rising Frankenstein is in his very words, threatening American dominance, threatening the Western um, um, led liberal order. Um, and then, of course, the, um, uh, the, the latest uh, fight over TikTok um, and also um, uh, China's 5G Huawei is more than technology. It's really um, looking at who is going to control uh, the kind of uh, change of lifestyle, uh, the kind of rhetoric promoted through social media. Um, but of course, the rise of um, um, uh, companies like Huawei threatens um, the, uh, um, Americans' leadership um, in, in, in the kind of technology world because 5, 5G is going to change not only lifestyle, but how, how businesses are conducted and have military implications. Um, but on the other hand, uh, in spite of the um, kind of um, a perceived um, intervention, American intervention in other countries, particularly pushback against China, um, um, against Russia uh, in the Middle East. Um, back home in the United States, there is a body of, of constituents saying that Americans should mind its own business and, and really to concentrate its efforts at home. Um, so I think that there is a bit of a dichotomy uh, in the um, uh, American uh, uh, politics itself. Uh, however, under Donald Trump, under the Trump administration, um, under his, um, um, uh, uh, his, his mantra of American first, in fact, he's de destroying a lot of the soft power, uh, which has made American great, uh, the kind of um, fair and, and also reasonable uh, um, a kind of a relationship with other countries, uh, and also spending efforts to contribute to the global commons rather than everything uh, for America and to help with the rest. Um, in fact, the Americans' dominant um, uh, have been declining for, for, for some time by various degrees. Uh, in fact, uh, for example, the world-renowned uh, economist um, Subramanian uh, of the Peterson Institute for international economics. Uh, he came to Hong Kong to make the presentation on this book called Eclipse. Uh, in the book, it is um, using proprietary technology. Um, it is found that the uh, more um, uh, 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 global currencies, um, they move in tandem, in other words, together uh, with the renminbi more than with the US dollar because the, the China has become the largest trading partner with all these countries. And of course, China is now, um, uh, is, is, um, examining its own development model. It's now concentrating on quality, on innovation. Um, hence this Made in China 2025, which again, of course, alarmed the United States a great deal. And in, in terms of uh, research, you know, scientific research, China is now more producing more scientific papers, cited uh, by a lot more uh, than the United States in a number of key areas. Um, however, the um, indiscriminate use of sanctions uh, indeed uh, threatens the dollar's um, uh, dominance because um, companies like uh, even HSBC or Standard Charter Bank uh, are not exempt from these um, uh, kind of sanctions and, and, and various countries, uh, they fear that if they use the dollar, um, that they, they could be a subject to, to the US sanction. But on the other hand, there is no substitute for it because the, the, the Remain Bay is far, far uh, behind. So what China is now doing is trying to mitigate some of the uh, the, 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 this kind of threat by developing um, the digital currencies. Um, but look, of course, the China is not a bed of roses. If you took a, re a reality check on China, uh, China is suffering a lot of um, uh, the kind of uh, threats, um, unbalanced, unstable, uncoordinated, unsustainable, including the environment, including the kind of um, um, indeed uh, increasing inequality, uh, the corruption, uh, the, uh, the China's aging profile, um, China's uh, middle income trap, um, the China subject to this kind of pushback, uh, and a lot of choke points controlling China's uh, 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 trade and in import of raw materials, uh, including the, uh, the port of uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Gulf of, um, of Hormuz, H-O-R-M-U-Z, outside Iran, and also um, uh, the Malacca Strait uh, outside Singapore. 
However, China's uh, it's been said that China's uh, it, 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 it depends a great deal on exports. But recently, um, the China's economy is changing more towards services as well as internal consumption. If you look at exports, it only accounts for um, a, a less than 10% of China's GDP. Uh, I'm talking about net exports because in China's exports has embedded uh, a great deal of imports. So if we subtract the imports from exports, uh, the net uh, exports accounts for less than 10% of China's GDP. And of course, the, the growth is now driven by services, uh, of course, by investments as well. Um, and also, according to uh, McKinsey, uh, the global consumption um, has been uh, gaining strength um, and uh, indeed is contributing to a great deal of global consumption growth. But even then, uh, the percentage of consumption is still, um, uh, you know, to be, be below something like 50 or 50 or 55 percent. There's still a long way to go. Um, as I said, the Make in China 2025 um, strategy uh, is, is, is viewed by the, the, the United States as a threat against its dominance, uh, particularly um, uh, combined with China's, um, uh, within Buddhist Jamaat's problematic uh, trade practices. However, China has now, over the years, has achieved a, a kind of uh, a leadership and dominance um, in, key, uh, in certain key technology areas, particularly in 5G, and also in quantum um, uh, computers and so on and so forth. So according to various research, um, uh, the readiness uh, in terms of 5G, uh, China is, 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 uh, has, has had a head start. But because of the pushback against Huawei and the pushback against um, various uh, kind of uh, technology inputs, uh, China is facing, <coughs> facing a great deal of headwinds. Um, However, the, uh, on the key areas like artificial intelligence, even though Americans leading, China is, is, is breathing down the Americans' neck, is trying to catch up, and indeed China is spending a great deal of um, money and investment uh, and in terms of policy to promote the um, uh, technologies in the, in, and also the application of artificial intelligence. Apart from trade and, and technology, uh, this energy, uh, there is a recent discovery uh, by China, the first of its kind um, of the largest um, uh, uh, um, uh, reserve of methane hydrates. Now, methane hydrates is the world's most concentrated um, uh, kind of um, energy uh, particles uh, because it's uh, buried deep into the sea. It's a kind of frozen um, um, kind of uh, uh, including a lot of methane very deep into the sea. But uh, about a, a year ago, uh, is uh, successfully extract um, a great deal of that in the South China Sea. And then the reserves um, in terms of uh, this carbon content uh, can last the world almost a thousand years in terms of energy. So I think that certain game changing developments are taking place. And China is now becoming uh, a, a green superpower. Um, it's just been announced that China aims at uh, carbon neutrality by the two, year 2060 and would achieve um, uh, capping uh, carbon uh, by the year 2030. And of course, China is now the world's biggest um, uh, production of um, wind, um, uh, wind turbines uh, and solar panels and so on. And not only uh, in terms of energy, but in terms of space technology, uh, China has now recently launched uh, its uh, GPS system, um, vying with uh, the the, uh, the American uh, leadership in that area. It's only uh, uh, amongst one of the uh, three uh, three countries uh, uh, capable of of this global um, uh, GPS system. In fact, it's a high degree of accuracy. And of course, China has now has successfully landed a probe on the back of the moon. Um, and, and, it's, and it's moving ahead with a space program, uh, not only in space, but in terms of uh, weaponry. Of course, China still, uh, the, in terms of the warheads, uh, is only a fraction of the uh, nuclear warheads accumulated by the United States and Russia. But I think that in terms of uh, modern warfare, uh, it, it is not based on, 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 on parity in terms of numbers. Uh, China successfully developed a certain um, um, highly uh, effective uh, defense, uh, high-tech defensive uh, systems, hypersonic missiles uh, with multi-warheads, uh, separately navigable. So I think that this, uh, in terms of defense, uh, is sufficient to withstand uh, American coercion. And of course, in the South China Sea, uh, China has successfully developed its capabilities called the A2AD, 
anti A2 stands for anti access, AD is area denial. Uh, in terms of the, um, for example, China can deploy um, mobile driven um, aircraft killer missiles and could in fact deny access by aircraft carrier groups uh, in this um, uh, near um, uh, sea um, uh, 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 areas. Um, and of course, China is now the first to recover from the pandemic, even if patchy, even if the recovery is patchy. Um, but then uh, China, as I said, may overtake the US economy by 2032. Um, now, having um, uh, uh, gone through all this uh, in modern times, you, you understand China, you've got to understand its past. Um, the so-called Middle Kingdom was in fact formed thousands of years ago uh, by assimilating uh, a lot of the small and ethnic groups, and China has got 56 of them. As only uh, people heard about uh, 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 Xinjiang and Tibet, in fact, there are many other uh, ethnic groups which live in great harmony. If you look at those down there uh, in the south. Uh, but of course, the, the, uh, the big areas like T Xinjiang, Tibet, uh, there are still a lot of problems uh, of, of, of racial harmony. Um, and you will look at the past uh, so many years, um, China and India uh, on left hand side of this top scale have, have been the largest economy in the world for, for thousands of years. It's only in the recent uh, couple of hundred years uh, that China and, 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 and India um, have became um, uh, smaller economies uh, compared with the West. Now this trend is now changing, as I said, if you look at that. And, and if you look at the left hand corner, it's quite remarkable that certain dynasties, um, China's GDP uh, for example, in the Ming Dynasty, 40 to 45 percent of the world's GDP. So, in terms of China's rise, uh, the Chinese leadership feels that it's only recovering its past uh, dominance. Um, of the high, the high tide of China's uh, uh, rise is in the Tang Dynasty, um, the so-called Golden Age. I mean, even by the um, I'm sorry, Mr. Long, but you should start to, to conclude. I'm sorry. Wow, sorry. Okay. Um, so there is a lot of corruption there. Um, and, and of course, China wants to get this uh, China dream there. Um, the Asian uh, Silk Road, of course, is China's uh, method to connect with the rest of the world, uh, particularly the Silk Road, the Asian Silk Road passes through Central Asia, um, and then the, the, especially Eurasia. Um, and China, of course, has the, um, a, a lot of uh, investments in, in, in Central Asia and the Middle East as well and is now um, investing in, in uh, um, Afghanistan, uh, potential investment opportunities, uh, China's Bell Road and in the South Caucasus, um, and then um, uh, even the NATO, uh, Turkey is now embracing the, uh, the Bell Road. Uh, and then this development uh, is uh, about Eurasia, uh, calls, um, uh, recalls this, um, a study uh, of the, 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 the so-called land power um, or continental powers vis-a-vis uh, -vis maritime powers uh, characterized um, by the West uh, dominance. Um, and of course, the, the China's Bell and Road is based on China's dominance in seaports. Um, the world's leading uh, seaports are in China. And, um, and the whole world is now um, uh, connected more and more by infrastructure. Um, and there is a group, a, 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 a huge deficit uh, of infrastructure investments around the world. So that hence the China Spare and Road, um, and then uh, with with its subsidiary uh, extensions uh, through uh, um, uh, Pakistan and other parts of the world. Um, and then the, of course the uh, the Bell and Road magnifies this connectivity. Um, and even linking um, uh, countries like uh, Afghanistan, you know, through all the way to uh, Turkey, to Europe. Um, and China's, uh, of course, building uh, as part of the Bell and Road, the global uh, digital suit row, uh, and even linking the Arctic uh, to complete the circle uh, as the Arctic melts and makes it e more easily navigable. In Europe, um, uh, China is now wooing the so-called 16 plus one countries, uh, which are the uh, Eastern European countries. Um, uh, that has uh, caused uh, pro problems as far as the EU is concerned. They regard it as a kind of uh, China's effort to divide the European Union. And if, as, as far as Italy is concerned, Italy feels itself is, is part, is the key point uh, of China's Bell, Road, Bell and Road because it, it connects um, uh, Venice, uh, is the end point of the Maritime Silk Road, is the beginning point of the economic belt. And with all these connect, uh, connected infrastructure, 
um, and, and India, uh, uh, Italy is, is very well placed. Uh, there is a lot of concern about the debt um, um, uh, indebtedness created by China's Belt and Road. Um, for example, it had been total port in, in Sri Lanka, but in fact, the Sri Lanka is already a very highly indebted country, it's not to China, but to other uh, players. Uh, and of course, the, the Belt and Road is the, uh, could be the last straw in the camel's back. So there is an accusation that uh, China is now the loan shark, as now as a new imperialism. Um, but of course, the, the, the Belt and Road only goes uh, where, the, uh, where angels fear to tread, uh, normally in backward countries. Um, so there is a great deal of hype and reality, um, whether or not all this debt is created by the Baron Row. Um, uh, there's some truth in that, but that's not the total picture. Um, and the Baron Row is now back on track, and hopefully China is now learning from some of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the criticisms. Um, the Baron Row is now le leveraging Hong Kong's strength under one country, two systems, uh, as well as the, um, uh, the Greater Bay Area. Um, the national security law, uh, uh, even though there are some uh, concern, uh, it still uh, rather uh, clears the, uh, the atmosphere uh, of, of this kind of unre uh, unrest. Um, China as a country lacks uh, democratic processes, but it's excellent in terms of uh, national outcomes. Uh, and according to various surveys, uh, there are um, more people um, um, in support of the government uh, compared with uh, Western countries. Um, for example, the left right hand side, the Harvard Kennedy School search shows that there are uh, uh, the level of support of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Um, so I really need you to conclude. I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. We, we are very wait. short on time. So, so so that's the, um, um, uh, the Asian Development Bank and uh, China is now growing in, in, in many, many different ways. Uh, so as, as far as the um, China is taking a very, very active role in the multinational system, including playing a very important role uh, in the United Nations. Um, and the, uh, the SCO, of course, says to integrate Eurasia civilization with the Bell and Row. Uh, this is the last slide, I'm sorry. Um, and that because the world is uh, full of problems which can have common interests, including the environment, uh, including uh, pandemic, uh, there are lots of areas which, the, for example, the exploitation of energy and then the sustainable development goals. So I think that the, it, it depends on how, uh, how the, the China is viewed. If we view it negatively, it could be a, a kind of Frankenstein. But of, of course, there's a lot of hype in that. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and without further ado, uh, because I don't think our first speaker is yet to, to join the room, I would go straight to, to the, the third one uh, on the program, Professor Anne Isabel Xavier from Observar while uh, playing our home turf uh, this afternoon uh, with a presentation on the CSDO and the EUAE and the path to a new Eurasia, return or retreat. And uh, I would give the floor to you, Anna. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to participate in this panel uh, being shared by Pedro Siabra, my dear friend, and uh, looking forward for the fruitful discussion that surely uh, will follow our uh, presentations. Um, I'm not going to use a PowerPoint presentation, and I will try to stick uh, to the 15 minutes uh, for, my, uh, for my presentation. So the title of my um, argument is CSTO and EAU. Uh, we will see the acronyms in detail. And the path when you raise your return or retreat, like Pedro uh, mentioned. And my main uh, research concern is that when we go back into the analysis of the collective security treaty organization. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Anna, just to interrupt. Mr. Long, could you just stop sharing your screen? Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. I'll, uh... Um, Anna, back. Thank you. And the Eurasian Economic Union founding pillars, three questions easily come up in my mind. Are we moving to a new Eurasian world with principles, interests, and an agenda that appears to contest the Western liberal order as we know it? Is it Russia with its relatively weak economy and many... Uh, social problems, the model that many will want to follow and compete for the shift in the balance of power in the immersion of new tensions? 
Is the Eurasia led by Russia rising to counter the hegemony of the US and the West led by EU and NATO apparent declining? Well, indeed, this presentation aims to explore the extent and the credibility of those temptations, questioning if there is a return or a retreat of a new Eurasia where Russia's engagement surely make us rethink East and West approaches, both for economic and security integration a key. Having said that, and with no further ado, I think that all my assumptions are even more pressing if we recall Vladimir Putin's interview to The Economist last year, right before he left to the G20 summit in Japan to discuss trade and security and met with Donald Trump and Theresa May, where he pro proclaimed that liberalism as an ideology that has, has underpinned Western democracies for decades is obsolete and had outlived its purpose. In the extent that President Putin long out to establish Russia as a counterweight to the liberal Western order, his comments are hardly surprising. Also, it's true that the liberal order established in the wake of the World War II is under stress like never before. Pandemics, migration, populism, rising of China and other emergent countries, climate change, artificial intelligence and technology are expanding as threats more than opportunities and both at national and multilateral levels, the ability to respond and react is endangered by the lack of strong and galvanizing leaderships. And when we look to the Eurasian Economic Union and the, and the Collective Security Treaty Organization, I think that we can acknowledge that the temptation to return more than retreat to a new Eurasia clearly exists. But before we discuss in what extent this might or not be an attempt to clearly disrupt and test the liberal world order, I think it is important to briefly explain what are we talking about. And to start, it is quite interesting to note that it was after the dissolution of the Soviet Union when Russia and the Central Asian republics were weakened economically and faced declines in their GDP, that the process of Eurasian integration began and post-Soviet states underwent economic reforms and privatization through the creation of the Commonwealth of Independent States on December 1991 by the presidents of Belarus, Kazakhstan and Russia. In 1994, during a speech at Moscow State University, the first president of Kazakhstan, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, suggested the idea of creating a common defense space and a regional trading bloc in order to connect and profit from the growing economies of Europe and East Asia. The idea was quickly seen as a way to bolster trade, boost investment in the region and serve as a counterweight to Western integration unions. As a result, numerous treaties have been signed by member states to establish the regional trading bloc gradually on the establishment of a customs union with open borders without passport controls between member states. In 2000, an Eurasian economic community, a treaty on a single economic space by Belarus, Kazakhstan, Russia and Ukraine in 2003, an agreement to create the customs union in 2007, a customs union in 2010, and an Eurasian economic space in 2012. On May 2014, the leaders of three states, which were part of the former Soviet Union, presidents of Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Russia, signed the treaty on the Eurasian economic union, which came into effect on 1st January 2015. Armenia and Kyrgyzstan accession soon followed as well. And it is very interesting to quote what Russian President Vladimir Putin stated at the time. He said, today we have created a powerful, attractive center of economic development, a big regional market that unites more than 170 million people. Also back in October 2011, Putin addressed a speech entitled A New Integration Project for Eurasia, the Future in the Making. And he declared, it took Europe 40 years to move from the European coal and steel community to the full European Union. 
the establishment of the customs union and the common economic space is proceeding at a much faster pace because we could draw on the experience of the EU and other regional associations. We see their strengths and weaknesses, and this is our obvious advantage, since it means we are in a position to avoid mistakes and unnecessary bureaucratic superstructures." End of quote. In fact, the EU already introduced the free movements of goods, capital, services, and people, and provides for common policies in the macroeconomic sphere, transport, industry, and agriculture, energy, foreign trade and investment, customs, technical regulation, competition, and antitrust regulation. Also provisions for a common currency unit in a span of five to 10 years and greater integration are envisioned in the future. In addition, Russia, Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Armenia aim to create a common electricity market until the end of this year, as well as a single hydrocarbons market by 2025. Obviously, the Eurasian Economic Union has always sought to base its model on the European Union, despite historical foundations, member states, and geography. In fact, as the European Union, the EAU also operates through supranational and intergovernmental institutions and also has two councils, one gathering the heads of the member states and the other the heads of the government of member states, one commission as executive body and a court as a judiciary body. But other factors must be considered. First of all, because geography matters. As the European Union benefits of an integrated market of 500 million citizens and many more behind its borders, and the 18.8 trillion US dollars in 2018, representing 22% of global economy, the Eurasian Economic Union has an integrated single market of 183 million people and a gross domestic product of over 4 trillion US dollars. However, geopolitics of resources also matter and a lot for the Eurasian re region. Russia has the world's largest natural gas, the eighth largest oil and the second largest coal, is the world's leading natural gas exporter and the second largest natural gas producer. No wonder that the Eurasian Economic Union is actively seeking to increase trade with East Asia, already initiated formal talks for official trade cooperation with ASEAN. In fact, some members like Belarus and Kazakhstan seek to leverage the Eurasian Union as a bridge between the European Union and the New Road Initiative, which clearly illustrates that the rising China has been in and the Eurasian Economic Union to facilitate its investments in the region. Also, the South Korean president launched a Eurasian initiative, which seeks to connect transportation, electrical, gas, and oil links from Western Europe to East Asia, which echoes China's longstanding New Silk Road project. In turn, in the security and defense dimension, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, consisting of Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia and Tajikistan also provides the basis for further integration. Also, for those who are not familiar, the Collective Security Treaty Organization is an intergovernmental military alliance that was signed on May 1992 by six post-Soviet states belonging to the Commonwealth of Independent States, Russia, Armenia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. Three other post-Soviet states, Azerbaijan, Belarus and Georgia, signed the next year and the treaty took effect in 1994. Five years later, six of all nine, all but Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Uzbekistan, agreed to renew the treaty for five more years. And in 2002, those six agreed to create the Collective Security Treaty Organization as a military alliance. The CSTO Charter reaffirms the desire of all participating states to abstain from the use of force. Signatories would not be able to join other military alliances or other group of states, while aggression against one would be perceived as an aggression against all, the same as NATO's Article 5. In 2005, the CSTO partners conducted some common military exercises. And in October 2007, the CSTO signed an agreement with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization to broaden cooperation on issues such as security, crime, and drug trafficking. 
On October 2007, CSTO members agreed to a major expansion of the organization that would create the CSTO peacekeeping force that could deploy under a UN mandate or without one in its member state. The expansion would also allow all members to purchase Russian weapons at the same price as Russia. On February 2009, an agreement to create the Collective Rapid Reaction Force that is intended to be used to repulse military aggression, conduct anti-terrorist operations, fight transnational crime and drug trafficking, and neutralize the effects of natural disasters also took place. But, and almost as my final remarks, in what extent the Eurasian Economic Union and the CSTO collides with NATO and the EU as providers of a collaborative or competitive integration of different civilizations within Eastern borders? In other words, are we moving to a new Eurasian world in progress, in the making for sure, but with principles, interests and an agenda that appears to contest the Western liberal order as we know it? Is the map being redesigned by new dividing lines? What is the way forward? A new Cold War? Well, I think that we need to be realistic, but also cautious and not too alarming. Of course, the tensions between the Eurasian Union and the European Union, as well as between the CSTO and NATO, occur, as both have sought to deepen their ties with several former Soviet republics through enlargement, privileged partnerships, and in large degree, economic and security sticks and carrots. The temptation to look at the Eurasian Economic Union and CSTO as a way to reunite many of the former Soviet republics and bolster Russia's ties to former Soviet republics is quite clear for the West. In December 2012, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton claimed, it is not going to be called that, Soviet Union. It is going to be called Customs Union. It will be called Eurasian Union and all of that. But let's make no mistake about it. We know that the goal is, and we are trying to figure out effective ways to slow down or prevent it." End of quote. On what considers the European Union, counter and deter the East was never a founding goal and will never be a pillar. But NATO, as we know, it was meant to keep the Soviet Union out, the Americans in, and Germans down. I'm quoting NATO former Secretary General Lord Ismay. The Warsaw Pact succeeded from 1955 to 1991, and one year later, CSTO as a collective defense organization was created. Today, when we look to NATO's narrative on Ivory and 360 degrees actions, we clearly assess that the readiness action plan and the assurance measures are clearly designed to endure for as long as necessary land, sea, and air activities in, on, and around the eastern part of Alliance territory through a graduate, flexible, and calibrated approach to protect the Alliance. In addition, NATO air policy might be selling as a peacetime collective defense mission, safeguarding the integrity of the NATO Alliance members' airspace, but as we know it is, it is designed to respond to the daily aggression that the Baltic countries claim to suffer. For NATO, Russia is still perceived as a privileged partner based in the strategic concept signed in Lisbon in 2010. And for the EU, Russia is, despite the sanctions following Crimea, despite the current situation in Belarus, and despite the vaccine nationalism that the President of the European Commission proclaimed last week in the State of the Union, a major bilateral partner. So to conclude, I want to say that neither liberalism is obsolete nor a new Cold War is arising. But at the same time, there is no retreat in the Eurasian world, but surely a long-standing temptation to return to the great geopolitics of the Cold War. That is why this apparent regional pop-up on the East seems to collide with multilateralism principles and values undermining UN legitimacy in a larger scale and competing for new areas of influence and hegemony. Many may argue that both Eurasian Economic Union and the CSTO are too fragile to, to structure a post-liberal order and that is too focused in Russia's revisionism and some neighbor countries that were not attracted 
neither to the EU or to NATO yet. But I don't think that we are in Cold War or in pure containment, but we are not in cooperation either. I would say to conclude that there is a realistic engagement that sometimes is constructivist, others disruptive, but surely make us rethink geography, but especially and always economy framed by geopolitics. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Excellent time management. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'll give the floor to our, to our very next uh, speaker, Paul Duarte, as well, playing it on home turf today from Observar Wall and with a presentation on which regionalism from Central Asia, the challenges of China's, the US's, and Russia's integration projects uh, in, uh, in Central Asia. Paul, to you. You have to unmute. Yeah, uh, can you hear now? Fine, and can you see the PowerPoint? Okay, so uh, thanks for these two extraordinary uh, presentations so far. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, well, um, now I'm, uh, my presentation today is about uh, um, Central Asia, and uh, I will I argue that there are uh, competing uh, projects uh, in, what, in what comes to re regionalism. Uh, and I would start uh, with the Chinese one uh, that was uh, at the very beginning uh, called One Belt, One Road, um, despite that uh, so far some academics still use the, the term of Obor, uh, but China has uh, updated it to Belt and Road Initiative. So, there is a kind of confusion with terms, and uh, this 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 doesn't help uh, uh, in, in, uh, students and and even uh, uh, um, experts. But I would say uh, that uh, this is uh, China's momentum. I would say uh, I studied China for some years. I, I would say that um, uh, this is not an emergent power, contrary to what many argue. I, 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 I believe that China is a re-emergent uh, uh, power. China itself as a state is a relatively new state with decades, but as a, a, a civilization, it's a millennial one. So it's time for China. Uh, I would say that uh, it's, it's Xi Jinping trying to make China great again, a bit like Trump but Trump used the, the, that slogan. So China's momentum is what we uh, have also witnessed in history with the so-called Pax Romana. This is the time of Pax Sinica to replace the so-called Pax Americana. So history is cyclical. Uh, there's no power that endures forever. You see, powers, it's according to Paul Kennedy. He says that powers, like the Portuguese power uh, empire, they, 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 they climb, they, they, they last for a certain moment, and then they begin with the relative decline, which is happening nowadays with the US. The US has now in relative decline, which, which is not the same as absolute decline. So, the absolute decline is the very moment when hegemony um, gives way to the new hegemon. So there is not consensus in academia or literature that, uh, uh, well, there is, the, I would say differently, there is the, the, the debate on China's uh, threat. There is the possibility of China replacing the US as the next superpower, but there is not, I would say, um, uh, a certain time period for that. Some argue that th this will be in 15 years, others 20. You see, the US is still the number one in terms of economics, in terms of military, and even in terms of soft power. I believe that this is the very uh, this is the weakest uh, the weakest um, 
let's say, component of Chinese power. It's the soft power, which is completely different from the U.S. soft power. It is not. It doesn't. It, it, it doesn't come from civil society, contrary to what uh, Joseph Nye has uh, has said. It comes from the government. You see, when people people are suspicious, say that to create a community of common destiny and then you have some missiles pointing to Taiwan or you create um, artificial islands in South China Sea so they don't buy it simply let's put it bluntly they don't buy it and uh, now China coming to say that let's 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 be the together with Russia okay so let's let's defend globalization it's uh, it's a win-win. No, it's not a win-win. We see that the opposite is not happening when, when uh, Western companies want to get access to, ch to, to China's market. But that's a different story. I, we could be here. It's a different topic. I would say that, uh, you see, this is also about connectivity, despite of the narrative uh, that it is now necessary for the Chinese Communist Party to um, keep together China's people at a time when um, corruption is a great problem in China. So what Xi Jinping is doing now is to fight corruption and um, at the same time he's trying to, to give to the Chinese a new picture of the Chinese Communist Party. It's the time where China needs to be pragmatic, where China needs to find a new narrative, where China officially never aspired to hegemony, but it doesn't mean no longer that China accepts to be in, 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 the, in, in the backstage of progress. No, China wants to be in equal foot with what happens in the, in the most developed states. China used to copy technology, its first aircraft career was actually uh, Ukrainian one. But you see nowadays, China no longer needs to copy. You see the Huawei, uh, Mr. Long has, has talked about artificial uh, intelligence, which is, was a very good uh, topic. Uh, you, see, you see many, many digital corridors, you see. Digi the, the, the Silk Road is not just about land and sea, it's digital, digital, digital roads as well. So in the future, we will see more of the same. That is, China is already exporting those machines that will help China to implement the Orwellian society, the great eye that sees everything. It has already been exporting to many countries. And the social credit system that already is uh, a reality under development in China may be a threat to democracy in the long term. But uh, today I'm not talking again about this. This is a very sensitive but very important topic for the long term. I'm talking more about connectivity. You see, China. China's idea is using Central Asia to connect Beijing to London in just 48 hours, again, in the medium long term, because China is a bit like Catholic Church. It projects always for the long run. Otherwise, you couldn't keep alive the most populous country in the world if you thought only in the short run. This, is, well, this would be impossible. But in the future, China is also considering to, uh, to build what we also have in Europe, uh, connecting France to the uh, United Kingdom, which is an underwater uh, tunnel that would have some approximately 200 kilometers uh, and would connect Russia to uh, North America. So there are no limits under the Tiansha, that is the all under heaven. That is the so-called Pas Sinica. And even or as uh, ambitious is the project of connecting 
the uh, two oceans, Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, which is called the Two Ocean High Speed Railway. And again, um, this is like a bit like a Nicaragua canal. We used to know more uh, a lot about. We used to hear about the Nicaragua Canal, but in my view, we don't hear anymore because Taiwan is now uh, is no longer in Panama's um, agenda. So that means that China prefers to use the Panama Canal instead of building a new one, a very complex one. But the case of Brazil is is a bit paradigmatic because I'm not sure if um, if. China will ever, uh, you know, uh, be allowed to 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 cross the Amazonia. This is a very uh, complex ecosystem. Um, but still, to finish, uh, so to finish the the, the, the connectivity connectivity issue, and uh, I would say that we also are also experiencing uh, a revolutionary project that aims to. Um, mitigate the so-called um, Malacca dilemma, which is which has never materialized, but so far has been omnipresent in China's in China's uh, in China's um, uh, foreign policy, and um, and this explains that China wants to build a, a, a three thousand kilometer uh, corridor connecting the uh, Xinjiang to the Indian Ocean. It's a polemic one, but I'm not talking about this. I just uh, want to now to, 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 to explain that the, the word New Silk Road is an ambiguous one, because you have the Chinese New Silk Road, but you also have the US New Silk Road. I, uh, what I can tell you about this, uh, and to keep my time, is that, um, Former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, when she was in Chennai, India, in 2011, there was a time, the first and I think the last one, uh, that she mentioned the word uh, U.S. New Silk Road. Um, because you, you see, the U.S. has a project, also uh, a regionalism project for Central Asia, despite it is an extra uh, regional uh, power, uh, contrary to, to Russia. But it wants to it wants to develop trade uh, etc um, let's see uh, when i was in central asia doing research i, I talked with many many people connected to intelligence they, they just asked me to, to not to be quoted uh, by their name but as original experts many people connected linked to the u.s uh, diplomacy they were great experts uh, in terms of uh, water management crisis, but simply, this is not a U.S. priority right now, Central Asia, and specifically under Trump, the America great again, uh, let's forget about the, our allies and concentrate uh, in ourselves. So, but originally, the idea was to develop Central Asia uh, logistics, but it, it is different from the, the Belt and Road Initiative in, I would say, one big uh, stake. Uh, the US ex excludes Iran. This is one, 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 one major difference. While you cannot exclude Iran, Iran is a regional power as well, a very rich power in terms of oil and gas. So you see what happened in history when you excluded, we excluded Germany that explains that Hitler has fostered national discontent and um, made the Second World War, whatever. But you cannot exclude Iran. Uh, and also, one different thing as well is that um, according to uh, US New Silk Road, uh, the most important is Afghanistan, which is also different when you when it comes to um, China's new Silk Road, China's Belt and Road Initiative, because how by China is present in in in, in um, Afghanistan, paying Taliban most of the time to secure their their stakes there, which is not effective by the way, 
Um, let's say that uh, China uh, prefers to focus on Central Asia. And uh, uh, illustrative at this regard is that um, from uh, some years, uh, um, you no longer have uh, the monopoly of oil and gas uh, that you used to have in Soviet or even in Russian times that, ended by, that was ended by the Chinese. So this is remarkable. The Belt and Road is creating a new system, a new pass Seneca, in which you mix connectivity, in which you mix a narrative, in which you mix, uh, you, you put together as well, e-commerce, digital Silk Roads, Baidu, uh, special program. Well, you put many things. You can also include, as Mr. Long said, uh, the digital currency, WeChat, when I lived in China, of course, I've seen many people using WeChat to, to pay services. You don't need the physical money. This, this is bringing uh, to China cashless cities, but this could be implemented in the Western world as well. So it's not just about ideology. I agree with Anna, it's not a cold war, but uh, I'm not sure whether uh, Samuel Huntington was right. I've been criticized by many people, experts, to defend that we may be witnessing a kind of um, clash of civilizations to the extent that a Confucianist one is different from the Western world order, from the Western culture. I, I did not, uh, you see, I, I kept my, my vision. I, 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 I keep it. I believe that these are incompatible values. I believe that you don't need a military war. And the proof of that is that you have a trade war. So the, the side of this trap has already begun. I, 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 I'm sorry for that, but it's my, it's my, um, it's my strong uh, vision that you don't need a military war to prove that you have incompatible values and civilizations. Um, but I'm not defending Chinese nor criticizing it. It has some good aspects and some bad aspects as well. So I would finish with this, Russian New Silk Road. Russia doesn't need a narrative um, to justify that Central Asia, it's, it's near abroad. And China knows it very well. China is, has been very careful in its Western flank, given Russia, um, economic ties, etc. Uh, despite, I'm not sure that CSTO works within Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's two different postures, two different stances. Uh, a bit like the Galileo program uh, in the European Union that has been cancelled due to suspicions over uh, Chinese using their intelligence, uh, European intelligence to build their own Baidu system, the Russian don't trust the Chinese neither. So, uh, but I would say that for Central Asian states, that is good to have a competition. That is good to have two different powers offering more and more they can choose. And the former president of, of Uzbekistan, Karimov, he knew very well how to play uh, two different states, one, one against the other. Uh, I would say that, however, and to finish, Russian project for, of integration in Central Asia is a bit risky to the extent that Russian economy is in decline, to the extent that uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, which is, let's say, of uh, Russia's project for Central Asia region, regionalism, I would say that is, it is built over, it is built on a previous failure that is precisely the Eurosec, Eurasian Economic Community. And simply, Central Asian states don't want to, to give Russia, uh, I will finish, the, the monopoly and to build 
uh, because Russia, Russia's intentions are, are, are intentions are not are not let's say economic. They they're geopolitical. Uh, this kind of states don't want to give Russia the leeway to build a European Parliament, but in Central Asia, like a Central Asian Parliament, because this is this is Russia's intent. It's to build something in Central Asia based on the EU supranationalism, with a, a single currency, a single parliament to give Russia strength. Of course, based on new Eurasian postulates, but these countries don't want to do this. They like the game. They like to see China offering and, and Russia offering them as well. So to conclude, I just want to say that these are very challenging times for geoeconomics, for geopolitics, for geostrategy, uh, for this world that it is too scarce in terms of resources. And therefore, there are no forbidden borders. Even the space, the asteroids, are now uh, the new limit uh, to bring energy to Earth. So you see that uh, even the policy of non-interference that has been for a long time China's great tenet is disappearing. Is disappearing, and it will be it will be very interesting to observe how how Russia and China will cooperate not only in Central Asia, but as well in Lato Senso in the world uh, sphere of power. Because probably we will be witnessing uh, the creation of a Iranian Russian Chinese axis. That is given to a large extent to Trump's administration policy. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you all. I finished on time. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. If, if you could just stop the, the, the share screen. Right. Uh, yeah. But thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We're just trying to, to keep the schedule here yeah. going. In the end, without uh, further ado, I'll just give the, the floor to Ekrem Ok and Uzgur Tufeki mm -hmm. from the Agri Ibrahim Sassan University and Cesaran International, respectively, with a presentation on transformation of humanitarian intervention uh, a comparative perspective, 1945-2020. Uh, I'm not. I know that both of them are in the session. I, I'm not sure who exactly who will be presenting. It's me. I will present. Oh, here we go. Thank you. You're at, you're at the floor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And hello. Uh, good evening to all. Uh, greetings from the eastern part of the Turkey. And it's very pleasure to be here. I would like to first uh, thank you to Sestran International and the uh, Organization Committee of the, uh, for their effort to prepare this Congress uh, and the all participants to be here to listen to us. Uh, okay, now. Is everyone okay with PowerPoint? Okay. Uh, this presentation is about uh, our ongoing work with Dr. Özgür Fekci. Uh, we are at the beginning stage of the study. Um, today, uh, I will present you our question and uh, how we will answer uh, our question and how to conduct, conduct the, this study. Okay, let's start. Okay, one of the leading controversies of the last decade is question of what is to be done when a state is unwilling or unable to halt a humanitarian crisis within its territory, or what if a country itself creates such a crisis? To understand better uh, with a metaphor, should we intervene if a bandit tries to kill our neighbor's kids and their father unable to stop the bandit? Or with Daniel Archibald's metaphor, should we intervene if our neighbor's husband beat up his wife? The concept of humanitarian intervention emerged from this concern and implies that a military intervention to internal affairs of a country which have, which have a group of people suffer from human rights violation by third party country or a group of countries or an international organization with or without the state's consent. 
Uh, although some problems in practice and uh, some states effort to follow their interests under the umbrella of the HI leads some erosion in reliability of the concept uh, and the justification of the interventions, it's clear that powerful states, especially have potential to intervene, are called to intervene in most human, human rights uh, violation. But unfortunately, states have potential to intervene, have no standard criteria to decide to intervene or non-intervene. In other words, I mean, they can intervene a state which has human rights violation, but they cannot intervene another state which has the same situation. This shows us that decision to intervene or non-intervene is comprised of multiple factors from the politics to economic, as well as the humanitarian motives. With the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, some radical change occur in international systems. The international area witnesses a wave of change and the humanitarian intervention concept is also one of them affected this way. Humanitarian intervention gained attention in 1990s. Academics, states, international organizations began to breach the wall of the non-interference and attach less importance to the concept of national sovereignty. The sanctity of the national sovereignty was reduced and the opinion that humanitarian violation as responsibility to protect by all state was gained more attention. It's noteworthy that after the Cold War, there is an intrinsic willingness among the states and the non-governmental organization to address humanitarian events. For example, in addition to great powers, the rising power in the regions with humanitarian problems were also more willing to do their part. Moreover, international organization became more organized to focus on human rights violation after the Cold War. The permanent member of the UNSC were less inclined to veto resolution about the humanitarian military interventions. After the Cold War, there were interventions, mainly really on manpower, and not just the limited to provide security. I mean, to be precise, intervener's task is not just limited to stop violence and provide security. As in the Istumur and the Somali case, interveners undertook a wide range of tasks, including building roads, civic centers, even holding elections and vaccinating children. And now our research question, is this transformation happened after the Cold War is still valid today? Or are we witnessing a new transformation in HI? And if it has happened, this transformation is towards a new one or old one. I mean, what is the direction of the transformation? And what is the feature of the transformation features? Uh, today, we can see intervention faster or more effective or more cautious and more reluctant. And application method of interventions. Do interveners still rely on manpower and intend to solve apart from the problems, apart from the military issues, or just try to solve issues only with airstrike? The permanent member of the UNSC still less inclined to veto a resolution about the humanitarian military inter interventions or vice versa. Okay, uh, in this table, table uh, we can see in the first 10 years after the end of the Cold War, six cases can be seen as uh, military intervention. Iraq 1991, Somali 1992, Haiti 1994, but Haiti is uh, arguable. Rwanda 1994, Estimur 1999, and Kosovo in the same year. But uh, in the next 20 years, 2000 and 2000, between the 2000 and 2020, only three military interventions carried out. Sierra Leone 2000, Libya 2011, and Syria 2014. Uh, this, uh, but against the, this one is against the ISIS, uh, not the uh, Syrian government. 
Uh, this table means that no humanitarian tragedy happened in this uh, 2000 and 2020. I don't think so. If we ask the participant in this room, everyone in this room can say a different human rights violation, I think. So humans still suffer in 24th century. Okay, purpose of uh, our work, the main purpose of this work to examine whether there is a new transformation in HI in the post cold War area regarding to decision-making process of intervention, the country is willing to, to engage in problems and the application methods. I mean, in other words, how the intervention is carried out. Uh, to avoid misunderstanding, I need to say that we are not saying that big states must intervene much and engage in every humanitarian problems, and they must rely on manpower and much more than air power. It's not our point. We are just focused and want to demonstrate this transformation happened in the 21st century. Okay, if there is, if there is. This transformation about a new trend or an old trend. I'm in pre-1919s. And the, what are the reasons and the drivers of this transformation? Also, we are trying to make a future projection or what kind of picture regarding HI will wait us in the future. Okay, now methodology. In this work, selected case will be examined with the comparative analysis method to reach our research question. The case to be examined will be picked from three different time intervals. First time interval, 1945 and 1990. Second time interval, 1990 and 2000. Third time interval is 2000 and 2020. The comparison of the case from the first time interval with the case from the second time interval will show us the first transformation in AHI after the Cold War. The comparison of the case from the third time interval with the case from the first and second time intervals will show us the differences and the similarities and whether there is a new transformation or not. First of all, the case selection at the case examination criteria will be identified. Cases in this, in, in this time uh, intervals will be selected according to identified case selection criteria. And this case, like which, examined according to case examination criteria. I want to refer to complexibility of the identifying criteria. Identify, identify case selection criteria is hard part of the job because as everyone familiar, familiar with the HI literature knows, reaching common criteria among the case is not easy. For example, I would like to some, give, a, give, uh, give out some example. According to Simon Duke, humanitarian interventions would appear to have two prerequisites. First, there must be a violation of human rights and it must be proven. Second, this violation has shocked conscience of humans and humiliate the international community. And for the Paul Christopher, four criteria sufficient for the determining the permissibility of the humanitarian intervention. Just cause, proportionality, last resort, and lastly, public declaration of the lawful authority. But as for the Nicholas Wheeler, there is no single case of intervention from 1945 that meets all these criteria. And it doesn't make any sense to think future intervention will meet this criteria. And Daniel Archibald answered the question of when is intervention required? His answer that international law commission will draft a guidelines to determine which case have a humanitarian emer emergency and the United Nations General Assembly will approve it. But as you guess, we don't have enough time to wait International Law Commission to draft the guidelines. 
Because of this, we need to determine our own criteria to choose case to work on. Okay, thank you for listening. I will be here uh, your uh, question and uh, contribution or any kind of uh, feedback. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ekrem. Uh, yes, could you just stop the share screen? Uh, thank you all. Uh, very interesting, very, very different and very interesting four presentations. Unfortunately, our fifth presenter, uh, I'm not sure he could join us or I, I still don't see uh, uh, his name on the, the participants list on, on, your, on your right. Uh, but with that said, I will just uh, use a bit and abuse a bit of my uh, position as moderator of this panel to, to start, kick off uh, a bit the Q&A with, with just a very short uh, comments and maybe try and push you all uh, against some of the, the things that you, that, you, that you presented here and maybe to try and uh, get a, a response uh, out of you uh, in terms of your ongoing work and hopefully they can uh, uh, contribute a bit to what you are all doing. Um, and then afterwards, I'll open up and see if some of the audience would also like to chip in and uh, pose questions of their own. Sorry? Uh, and very quickly, uh, I'll start with, with Mr. Long's presentation. I think, I think you, you actually made a, a very good, uh, you, you painted very very, very nicely the, the overall depiction of the challenges uh, that, that China might, is facing and might still face uh, in, the coming, uh, in the coming years. Uh, and I think you provided a very broad overview of those challenges and you could pinpoint some of those that, that, that might affect more or less China's ambitions uh, in terms of its external projects, so to speak. But I, as I was listening to you and also reading your, your abstract, and I was wondering uh, if we can also add a different layer to distinguish those kinds of challenges in the sense that they all seem to, very, to be either thematic ones or carry out or led by external powers. And I think some of the, the, the episodes and instances that we have been observing in the last few years is that China can also be challenged, for example, by local populations uh, in countries where they are trying to uh, implement large uh, infrastructure projects. And I was wondering if those kinds of challenges uh, on a more local or a mini level should also be accounted for in terms of what we can expect China to, to, to instill uh, in the overall international uh, community. Um, in terms of Anna, I, I actually have a, a couple of points here because I, I, uh, even in my own work, I'm very interested in terms of international organizations and in terms of multilateral mechanisms. And I'm, all, all, I'm always fascinated by how, by how this kind of projects might be instrumentalized by uh, whichever country is in the lead. And I was wondering if we can add map or if we can pinpoint some evolution in the mandates of those two organizations in the sense that, uh, of knowing if they've also adapt, adapt themselves, uh, uh, if their mandates adapt themselves to the changing international context or if they are, have been designed as such from the start and, and are mostly empty shells or rather hollow uh, in their overall aims. Are they serving a are they serving a purpose just to be instruments for the leading power behind them, in this case, Russia, or are they actually fulfilling some of the original goals that were set forward uh, when they were uh, created? And at, the same, at the same time, when we're talking about this kind of uh, uh, mechanisms and organizations, there is quite the literature in terms of, of knowing whether their own internal bureaucracies uh, have a life of their own and are actually able to push uh, in a different route or towards specific issues. And I, even though they are both very young, uh, so to speak, organizations, I was wondering uh, if we have seen, or we have witnessed some kind of uh, instances where, where these organizations that might be uh, going down that path in terms of having their own internal bureaucracies 
concerned with specific goals or whether we, we're mostly, again, seeing a play by Russia instrumentalize them uh, as, it, as it wants, as, as it can. And at the same time, I was just wondering if they are being actually used uh, in the same playing field, in, in the sense of whether uh, an economic union is being pursued at the same time or simultaneously as those security interests by CSTO, or whether or not uh, there is an actual strategy in terms of adapting to the agenda and to whether international developments in the region ask for more a more economic tailed approach or a more security um, tailed tailored approach. Uh, yeah, and that's that's about it. Uh, regarding regarding Paul's, I, I was actually I, I was very it was very interesting to, to, to see that there might be actual competing narratives, uh, whether we call them Silk Road or not, but in, by other countries towards this, this very uh, same region. But I would, I would maybe push you on, on, on the use of the regionalism concept and whether or not we are actually seeing the promotion of regionalism as led uh, by these countries, whether China, Russia, or, or the US, uh, or whether or not we, we, are, we are witnessing a more a la carte uh, approach in which you cherry pick uh, the partners in the region which you want to work with instead of actually creating the, the notion or the narrative of a region. Uh, because if not, I think at the very least we are, we are seeing these countries also pushing the boundaries of our preconceived notions of what a region uh, looks like or should uh, look like, and and so if that's the case, maybe we should really be stop. So we really should stop talking about uh, Central Asian regionalism, given that we are going beyond just Central Asia and, and trying to to maybe push a bit forward uh, the concept. But this is just a bit of a provocation uh, in order to to maybe think this uh, uh, through. And uh, I, I, I uh, yes. In terms of the, of the of the bite that you that you mentioned that, that Russia and China might not have the same bite as the U.S. if we consider them as overall equal players in, in the international uh, uh, context. But I wonder if uh, even if that's true, whether or not they have different bites, and whether or not we should be talking about different uh, uh, ways not to punish, but to cause uh, harm or affect relations that we also have to take into consideration. I'm, I'm just bringing this up because I, I, I found it very uh, illustrating the, this, the, this notion of the bite and whether or not they can actually bite and, and, and cause uh, an impact. And then to the very last presentation, uh, I think this is a, it's a, a very interesting way to, to start a research project and it clearly shows uh, what you're aiming for. And I, I was wondering because it clearly your focus or your interest in, uh, in, in uh, accounting for this possible transformation in terms of how humanitarian interventions played out in the last decade and whether or not there was even an intervention to, to speak of. Uh, but I, I was wondering if you also are planning on accounting for certain normative developments that clearly affected uh, or, or are considered to be one of the reasons why we are seeing less formal uh, humanitarian interventions. And I've, I'm, of course, thinking of, of the issue of R2P and responsibility to protect and whether or not that should also be taking into account uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the research design uh, of your project. Uh, because clearly, uh, from the, the offset, I would probably argue that one of the reasons why we are seeing that kind of trend in, in terms of seeing less formalized humanitarian interventions might, be, might just be because some of the very recent ones uh, really went badly and, and overused the tools that they had at their disposal. And so that might be one actual uh, route to pursue uh, your, your research as well. And may, another suggestion that I would possibly, uh, I, I could possibly make here uh, is that maybe humanitarian interventions have also gone, gone uh, a bit um, 
they've also ad possibly adopted different routes than from the past. We were probably very used to, uh, to consider humanitarian interventions as those uh, led by the UN or big UN interventions and big UN peacekeeping uh, missions. And I, I, I could poss probably make the argument that we are now possibly seeing the same kind of number, the same number of humanitarian interventions, but possibly assuming uh, different formats, maybe on a more regional level uh, with less flashy uh, initiatives or missions, which might be one of the reasons why they are also uh, going under the radar, so to speak, in terms of an overall uh, depiction uh, of uh, humanitarian interventions. But those are just a very few uh, comments that you might find helpful uh, as you move forward uh, with, with that project. And with that said, uh, I, I, uh, this was just some of very overall uh, comments and ideas just to, just to push a bit of debate. But because we have, a, I think, a very sizable uh, list of participants, uh, I would also, before giving you back the, the floor to, to possibly answer some of these comments, I, I would uh, just uh, do a very quick uh, roundabout to see if uh, some of the participants would also like to pose uh, specific questions. Uh, I've no just noticed that the, the chat option is actually not uh, available uh, for the public, but uh, if you could uh, possibly uh, use the raise your hand uh, function, uh, I'm sure the organizers can give you audio privileges uh, to pose some questions. Let me just see if someone dares to join me in, in commenting uh, the presentations. We seem to have a very shy audience, but uh, if that is the case, I will then uh, give you a bit of more of leeway in terms of the time available uh, to, to possibly expand on my remarks and also on, uh, on your own presentations and, uh, and some of the things that we, you might choose to pursue uh, down the line. And uh, I'll just go over and, f and follow the, the same order. So, Mr. Long, I, I would give you back the, the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, th thank you, Pedro, for highlighting this uh, interesting dimension uh, about the um, pushback against China uh, in terms of the host countries um, of the China's Berlin Road. Um, in fact, there's more than um, pushback from the host countries. It's a pushback from many countries, particularly, of course, the United States. But of course, the considerations are very, very different. Now, in terms of the host countries, to answer your question directly, I think that there's a perception that um, the Belt and Road Initiatives uh, is uh, generally regarded as non-transparent because um, uh, and there is no clear uh, uh, kind of uh, um, plan or, or detailed program as to who are going to be invited to take part. Um, and then what's the, um, the end um, um, uh, objectives are and, and, and then how the host countries are able to pay back the debt and how to what extent uh, the debt would add to the um, already heavy debt burden uh, of the host countries. Uh, apart from the fact that there is always perceptions of corruption um, and then um, lack of transparency and impact on the environment. Um, so are the, the, these are all legitimate concerns which China has got to take in its train. But then um, there is a general uh, overall concern about the rise of China that's not limited to the whole country, sort of Baron Mo. Uh, as I was trying to highlight, um, the, um, the China's emerging uh, as a kind of um, great um, 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 uh, empire, uh, trying to conquer the world and trying to replace the United States uh, as the global hegemon. Um, now, um, of course, uh, you look at history are always transition of power. But this time around, it is a, um, um, from a different civilization, from a different uh, ideology, and then um, one with uh, doesn't necessarily share so some of the values held dear uh, in the West. 
And so that is uh, the, that, that, the, the, the great, great concern in the United States across the political aisle. And then, of course, um, uh, uh, right in the heart of the concerns of um, country, Western countries in Europe um, and other parts of the world. Apart from the fact in the Middle East, uh, for example, in uh, even in Turkey, um, the question about the the, the, um, the, the Uyghur population uh, in China, of course, is also another dimension, uh, which of course uh, worries countries uh, which um, aim at protecting uh, the interests of this um, uh, of these ethnic groups. But apart from that, I like to highlight a very very um, important dimension, uh, which cuts through it all which is that um, I think that there is a great, great misconception uh, of, of what China wants uh, across the whole world. Um, this um, um, uh, thought that China is trying to replace the United States as the hegemon, um, I don't think that um, Beijing is stupid enough uh, to do that because um, A, not many countries um, embrace China's ideology. Uh, even though they welcome China's investments and China's up, um, opportunities for, for trade and, uh, and and creating jobs, uh, but they, 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 uh, I think many countries would resist uh, the kind of um, um, uh, China as the global leader um, with a kind of um, authoritarian uh, kind of system. Um, but on the other hand, I think what China wants is to, as I was trying to say, have a great, great history. And then for many thousands of years, China had been the greatest economy in the world. And then for the past two centuries, China was under the thumb of Western aggressors trying to divide China and, and uh, Chinese people um, um, being sort of um, living under the, the, the uh, can, cannot hold their head high in the world. But first time, the, the, the time for China has come to restore its national pride. Now, of course, uh, as China, um, and, uh, people always refer to um, Deng's um, uh, mantra of hiding and biting, you know, sort of, so you, you shouldn't show your uh, um, um, a strength um, and then you, you shouldn't project yourself. But then as um, my favorite example is that if you, even if you are a panda, if you are a, a million pound panda, no matter how gentle you are, <laughs> you, you're bound to affect other people. So I think that there's a great misunderstanding of what China wants that really informs um, a great deal of pushback against China. And then it takes a lot of time to understand, you know, sort of um, what the, the, or the whole mechanics uh, of, of the China system. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, Paul, I, I will repeat the questions just in a minute. Just let me give the, just follow the order and give Anna the opportunity to also possibly reply some of my comments or, or maybe uh, counter-argue them. Uh, but yes, Anna, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro, for the great, great questions. I, I'm so sorry. I'm going to disappoint you. I don't have a proper answer to those questions, though I do have a personal opinion and a personal feeling that is also based on the fact that I live in Portugal and I don't live in Lithuania or in Estonia. That changes a lot when we're talking about Russia. And the fact is that um, being an academic and living in Portugal gives me uh, an approach towards Russia that I think it's, it's a little bit more balanced if I were in the Baltic countries. Having said that, um, I think that your question is very, very interesting because it is obvious and it's a very proper question to ask if they are only serving a purpose, only being instrumentalized by Putin's ego, or if they are fulfilling the original goals of the uh, creation of this organization. I would say that both the European, uh, the, the economic uh, Eurasian organization and the collective security treaty organization they were designed for further integration. And if the Eurasian Union was designed in a step-by-step -step approach, so first of all, it's economic cooperation, then we will uh, further think about economic integration, and we are giving small steps even towards a uh, unique currency and the absolutely integrated uh, market in terms of the four freedoms, goods, capital, people, investment. So in the case of the European Union, it is a small step integration. In the case of the CSTO, since the beginning, it looks like we are, uh, uh, we are reading the 
uh, NATO uh, founding uh, documents and the NATO uh, founding uh, concept because we have it all. We have an Article 5, we have multi-annual exercises to um, harmonize and to integrate different uh, approaches of the member states. We have privileged relations between the allies, so we have it all. So I would say that even if we are um, not very critical on the fact that these two organizations uh, could be seen only as Vladimir Putin's ambition, because they are not only that, but for sure, I would say that they compete and contest the post-Soviet space. We still have some countries, like I said, Belarus, Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan, that are still in the Russians' influence. They are not in the European Union's influence yet. And they are not in the first line of the EU's uh, or NATO's influence. They are not part of the enlargement of the EU or the privileged partnership of the EU uh, through the um, European neighborhood policy. So they are still very much in the Russians' influence. And for that uh, reason, I would say that it is an instrument in the extent that uh, we clearly see Putin's ambition to have a united post-Soviet space. But it's not uh, uh, enough to say that it is a clear competition towards the European Union on NATO. I would say that both organizations are trying to do uh, its own road. They are trying to have its, its uh, own uh, partnerships and uh, allies, even with the ASEAN countries, with China mainly, uh, because they want to be big. They want to be strong. Also because they want to compete with the UN NATO, but mostly because they want to be strong by their own. So I would definitely say that there is an evolution there is also a very much step space to, to evolution, but they are at the same time fulfilling the goals, adapting and serving a purpose that in my opinion is to have a united post-Soviet uh, space towards Russia influence, but with a very strong commitment to the global leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Paul, just to sum up some of the comments and the main question that I was actually uh, posing to you, um, I, I was just I was just trying to push a bit against your 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 idea that or the use of the regionalism concept and whether or not we should uh, maybe adapt to the, the bit the lens of analysis in terms of of what we we are saying that we are witnessing in terms of what these countries are trying to do towards these countries and this vast land masses and, and the fact that you the, that you actually showed very nicely different competing geopolitical narratives that, that are, are maybe aiming for the same overall goal but calling it a different thing but whether or not we, we, we should be calling this regionalism trans regionalism or if there is even a problem with the word regionalism and if we should be uh, starting to consider a bit uh, different notions of what these countries are trying to do in terms of, of, of uh, creating different supply chains that, that cut across uh, land masses and continents and uh, defy a bit uh, our, our previous notions of, of regional projects. Should we still be talking about Central Asia uh, uh, as, as, as a regional goal or, or, or are these countries moving beyond that and, and tarnishing uh, that idea. That, that was essentially my, my comment to you. Yes. Thank you, Pedro. That's very pertinent questions. Indeed, that's not one question, but there are several tough questions. But, you know, in China's, from China's point of view, uh, uh, it's better to have, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, a relative, uh, let's say, to to to, to privilege the, the the periphery, than to uh, nowadays, uh, than to um, continue with some vague relationships with uh, with uh, extra regional powers. So China, it's not by coincidence that China, that China's Belt and Road Initiative was actually launched at Nazarbayev University in uh, Kazakhstan, which is 
um, a stable country. I've been there twice or three times. Uh, very, 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 very nice country. Uh, let's say that it's the ninth um, biggest country in the world. But in terms of Uyghurs, minorities, in terms of ethnic ties with China, in terms of gas, oil, I would say that it's not by coincidence that, that you have China privileging its periphery, its large periphery. Uh, China is uh, aware that no uh, big countries, big powers worldwide uh, are actually or became big countries without first um, focusing on its periphery. Uh, that is why, um, or at least that explains partially that China is so committed to stabilizing Xinjiang. Xinjiang is the very core of China's um, national and as well uh, uh, foreign policy. That is the main, the main stone of, of the Belt and Road Initiative. It's not just the construction companies that need to keep building, uh, while, where, whereas in China there has almost everything been built. Uh, it's also and mostly about Xinjiang. So the periphery is very important for China. While for Russia, it has already been uh, said here that Neurasian postulates never disappeared in Russian conception. Um, you know, I talked to several several experts in, in Central Asia. They are all nostalgic of the time of the Soviet Union. Um, I, I've, I've been, uh, I've been, I've not, I, 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 I was only in three countries. Uh, not uh, let's say Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. I don't know um, yet so far. I, I don't know the Turkmenistan or or Uzbekistan because these are more complex uh, countries to visit. Uh, but from what I heard of local people, they feel nostalgic about times of the, the, when the system took care of everything. Um, Moscow took took care of everything. Everything was functional. Nowadays. Uh, things are neglected. And, uh, um, you know, I asked people, what do you feel about the Chinese? You know, I, I got an, a, a curious answer. You know, we welcome Chinese money, one has answered me, but we don't like the Chinese himself. And this, this is quite um, telling about, about China's stance, not only in, in Central Asia, but in the world. This explains why you have Chinese ghettos ghettos in, in, in big cities. I had a, a teacher once that told me that was not us Westerners that pushed Chinese into ghettos. It was themselves that, themselves that actually created this. Or because they simply don't understand the world or they don't want to mix with us. I'm not, you know, I'm not a sociologist. I don't know how to understand these, these issues. But what I, I noticed is that this kind of Central uh, Asian countries, they don't want to be dependent either on, neither on China, neither on Russia. They just want to, to keep profiting from the, this, this Chinese factor that has broken the monopoly uh, of, 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 of the, the, the oil and gas pipelines. So they are enjoying it, but it doesn't mean that um, they, they fear China. Yes, they, fear, they do. Even Russia fears China. See the, the eastern part of, uh, of Russia, Siberia, where you lack people. Uh, I think it's, it's a common feeling against China, but we have to deal, uh, to learn how to deal with China, to accommodate to China, or probably think in a different way uh, in adapting. Otherwise, it will be complicated for our values and system to survive. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Ekrem, uh, if you could, uh, I would challenge you to, to try and, and, and give a very last comment in, in, a, in just a very brief three minutes or so. Yeah, uh, but I'll, I'll give you the... one or two minutes. Okay, okay thank you for uh, feedback. And uh, I, no I note that. Uh, first of all, uh, 
there is uh, really uh, really uh, lots of uh, literature in the first transformation of the humanitarian intervention after the uh, Cold War, uh, but we know this uh, new transformation after the Cold War second transformation. Uh, you know, uh, everyone knows uh, there is a uh, humanitarian intervention, very broad concept. Uh, there is political aspect, aspect of that, uh, ethical aspect, aspect and military aspect of humanitarian intervention. But uh, we limited our research with just the military aspect of the humanitarian intervention. We just focus how the countries applied their intervention uh, before the 2000 and now how they applied. Uh, we notice uh, after the Kosovo, there is increasing willingness uh, to countries about uh, uh, using air power, not much the manpower. Be be uh, before the Kosovo, uh, countries intervene uh, really on manpower and they are trying to solve uh, problem apart from the uh, military issues, not just the uh, stop the violence. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, there is a very concept uh, subsidies for the humanitarian intervention. For example, there is no concept of R2B before the 2005, and uh, 2000 after the 2005, we uh, witness a, a responsible to protect R2P. Uh, and now Brazil have a, uh, another, uh, I forget the name of this, uh, another concept. And we will uh, emerge uh, humanitarian intervention, R2P, and uh, peacekeeping operations under the umbrella of the uh, humanitarian intervention. And we will pick our case uh, according to our uh, identified case selection uh, criteria. That's why I said uh, the criteria is the uh, most part of the job. Uh, okay, I will, but uh, I will try, take into consideration your uh, comments. Uh, thank you for the feedback. And uh, another question, I will be here. Okay. Thank you, Ekrem. Uh, unfortunately, we are, we are really running short on time and we really have to, to close down this panel. Uh, I would like to thank Andrew, Paul, Ekrem, and Anna for, for this uh, world tour that we took with, with this panel. We, we went to, 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 to very different and very interesting topics that touched upon uh, different dimensions of international relations and Eurasian. Uh, but uh, I'd like to commend you all for your presentations. Uh, I would like to also uh, to tell you that in just a few minutes, we'll have a, a book uh, presentation, a book discussion panel actually on America in Af Afghanistan, foreign policy and decision-making from Bush to Obama to Trump by Professor Shaifullah Dorani. Uh, yeah, I would invite you all to stay on this very uh, same Zoom meeting link. Uh, to those of you uh, will still be a part of the remaining uh, day of the conference tomorrow. Uh, I wish you all a very good work proceedings and uh, I hereby close uh, this panel. Thank you so much and uh, have a very good rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you.